Hey guys, welcome to PC Perspective. We are here with a special edition live stream, I guess I'll call it. It's uh, 1230 a.m. Eastern time right now. What time does that make that for you, Josh? Like 1 p.m.? 1032 Mountain Standard Time. Standard time. You add, know what? Add that two minutes because okay. the rotation of the Earth and quantum mechanics. So that reminds me, I need to change our time zones on our live streams because somebody already yelled at me because, well, actually, we're switching to daylight t savings time now. So I've been off. Uh, all the times have been wrong for six months. So now I'm just going to leave it so that it will be correct again. Uh, was that next week? Yeah, so, uh, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about a new graphics card release. Today, we are finally seeing the AMD Hawaii GPU release. Da 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 da. You're Jack Lord, right? And I'm Dan O. It could be whoever you want to be, Josh. Really? No, no, nope, take that back. I definitely I take say, that get, back. You know, you know, Frontier Airlines flies nonstop from Cincinnati, Cincinnati to Denver. To Denver. <laughs> they do, they do. <laughs> I'll meet you with a letter. All right, let's let's talk about what we're here to talk about. Um, the AMD Radeon R9 290X, also known as Hawaii. It's uh, it's a new GPU. So you, you'll know that uh, AMD brought a lot of people out to Hawaii for a tech day, uh, media uh, analysts, partners, that kind of stuff. And they told us about new GPUs, in particular this new GPU. Uh, but a couple of weeks ago, you saw us post a review of the 280X, 270X, 260X. These were all essentially rebrands, the same card that we had seen before. Um, but now we actually have the new guy, the new guy. This is the actual new architecture. Um, it's new ish i guess i would i guess i would say is that is that fair josh it's like it's 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 gcn architecture which we already know with a couple of little tweaks and just a lot more shaders yeah the the basic building blocks are the same but instead of making a 10-story building in chicago with bricks you're you're now looking at a 16-story brick building in new york does that make sense a little but a little. Yeah, it's 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 they have done some nice things with it. They have resectionalized if that is they kind of reorganize term. things. Yeah. Yeah. And they have made it even more efficient. Uh certainly in your review that you've done, they show the increases in performance, uh increases in 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 shader operations, memory bandwidth, and mm -hmm. then the increase in the actual die size. And the increase in die size is small as compared to the other uh, increases that they've had. Right. So AMD has done some fantastic things with GCN in the past two years since it was introduced. Right. They doubled the primitives per second, which is essentially a geometry processing, almost doubled them. Um, took the theoretical compute power from 4.3 up to 5.6 teraflops. Uh, you know, your texture fill rate, your pixel fill rate, your peak bandwidth have all increased. It is, it's actually, the memory is running at a lower frequency, but it's a 512 bit memory bus now instead of a 384. Um, so the peak I think the last line of this table, the peak gigaflops per millimeter squared, is only really going up five percent. So does that does that say that maybe the efficiency of the GPU didn't improve as much as something like you know just looking at the geometry geometry processing indicates? No, I I wouldn't say that because okay. they have not gone down to a lower process node. They have not right. increased the die size by a large extent 25 but they have yeah but they, uh, but they have achieved some some pretty impressive gains in overall performance you know i remember when uh, i first saw the gcn architecture i think it was uh was it apu 2011 don't ask me to remember those names yeah <laughs> uh and eric deemers was on there and he was talking on stage and we had gone from a vliw5 and vliw4 architecture to GCN and this was this was a massive shift this was something that was you know on the scale of what Nvidia had done from the GTX 7800 7900 series to the G80 chip which was the first DirectX 10 pro product out there and 
it's in fact a little bit more forward looking than what we have seen from NVIDIA so far because they've been able to extract more performance and more functionality and a little bit more fun uh, flexibility than uh, what we have seen in between, like, say, the uh, the Kepler architecture in between GK104 and GK110. Okay. I don't know whether you agree with that or no, not. No, it, but it's, it seems reasonable. Um, let, I want to get into some of, the, like, the actual photos of the cards, benchmarks, talk about that kind of stuff. If you guys have questions in the live stream, feel free to ask them. Scott is in there. He's going to take some of the better ones and filter them back to us through the chat so we'll be able to answer some questions in real time as we go uh, but let's talk let's look at the graphics card itself if you paid attention to the gpu 14 event that was happening all the live streams the tweets that were going out the card itself is not going to look surprising to you i like the blood uh the black and red coloring in it um it's a little bit cheaper feeling than some uh, what was it the 4000 series or the 5000 series cards that had real like heavy weight to them they had a back plate on the pcb and then suddenly they got away from that but the 5870 yeah okay there you That's go pretty beefy yeah so so i mean i like the way this looks it's fine uh you can see a little bit more of the table the specifications they're talking about I mean, it's a 6.2 billion transistor chip it's just that's a lot that's a lot um we're talking about – we'll talk about engine clock. They rate it as up to 1 gigahertz. I have a little bit of an issue with how they're rating that. It's 4 gigs of DDR5, GDDR5 memory on this thing, 4 gigabytes of memory. It's running at 5 gigabits per second on a 512-bit bus. So uh, still uh, higher memory bandwidth than uh, the 280X or HD 7970. Um, good specifications there. Still only requires an 8-pin and a 6-pin power connector, which is nice. And this is an interesting photo. Crossfire bridges are gone. They're gone. They're gone. But the leads are there, so they weren't quite sure they needed to be gone, but they're gone. Um, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. Nothing really special in the back. Still got the uh, the good display outputs that I like off of the uh, 280, 270 series. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got one right here, as you can see. We've got our 2GVI full display port and full size HDMI. It's a really nice looking card. It, it, it is a nice looking card. Um, I do like kind of the design to it. Uh, although I still think PCBs look, these cards all look way better when there's something on the back of them. So um, that, that could almost be made into a pop song. Okay. You yeah. write it and I'll sing it. That always, do you remember that when uh, I think it was 2009 in, in QuakeCon that we saw the first uh, HD 5800 series, but we didn't know what they were, and it was kind of revolutionary in the in the backplate uh, setup with two DVIs, HDMI, and DisplayPort. Even though nobody had yes, they were the first display introduced port. to DisplayPort by quite a while, I think. Yeah, and so we, we've gone up through all these other iterations, <laughs> and we've come back. <laughs> Sometimes to what it was just really, works. Yeah, it was the most effective setup that we had seen yet. So other than the architecture change uh, of this, the, the other major change is power tune and variable clock rates. So power tune is a, is a technology that's been around for a couple generations, and uh, they kind of introduced this with, I guess, the 7870 gigahertz edition? Was that the first one that had boost? No. I think it was just 7970 with boost, or 7870 with boost. Now I'm, I'm drawing yeah. a blank. But, um, yeah, 7970. 7970 with boost because that's when uh, yeah. nvidia came out with the gtx 680 gotcha so uh, the the idea was always you know the same between both these vendors how can we get a little bit more processing power in the same thermal envelope uh and to be honest with you the initial integrations or implementations from amd were pretty dumbed down right they um, didn't have a whole lot of logic to them. They were very fixed. So th the fact that you had like a boost speed, but it was 50 megahertz across every single product didn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? And why not just make that the new clock speed? NVIDIA's, uh, their Kepler parts had GPU boost in it. It was much more complex kind of uh, uh, onboard calculation that was going on between power consumption, voltage, temperature, fan speed, that kind of weird uh, conglomeration of stuff. And now the new power tune on the R9 290X is very similar to that. Uh, they're using 
what they call second generation serial vid interface, new VR control interface. Uh, it's actually using the 290X, the 260X, and socket FM2 APUs. Um, and it's designed to enable next generation power tune for voltage switching times in the order of 10, is that microseconds? Yep. Um, so what does power tune do? It attempts to control uh, fan power and performance in order to maintain operating temperatures or vice versa. Uh, Here's a, here's a couple of key points. AMD has put the target temperature of this GPU at 95 Celsius. Which is a little toasty. It's more, th- in my opinion, it's more than a little toasty. It's, uh, you know, the architectures are different, so you can't directly compare them, but uh, NVIDIA's target temperature is 80 C on all of its Kepler parts that have boost. Um, and the 280X, when I was running, it was like in the 75 C range. So a 95C range is pretty damn hot. It's well, really damn hot. Go back a generation and see the uh, the Fermi, which was GTX 400 and GTX 500 series. They were 95 degrees centigrade. Right. And parts. But to be fair, at the time, what did everybody accuse those parts of being? Too hot. Right. Right now, AMD has come out and they said, "Yeah, look, we know 95C is maybe warmer than you're used to, but we're confident in our capability to run these parts reliably at 95C. Um, so if they're standing behind it, then I don't see it as a I, I won't I don't see that as a reason to not buy the card because you somehow are adverse to 95 degrees Celsius running yeah, parts. Yeah, because these th- these chips are spec to usually about 105C. So you could boil water on them. Mm. You could fry an egg if you had enough of them right right but it's not out of bounds okay. in terms of what the silicon ha- can handle now so th- the idea is it, it monitors all these things and then it adjusts clock speeds accordingly and as the consumer or as the buyer you can go into the control panel and adjust things like your desired maximum clock speed, your desired maximum power limit, your desired maximum fan speed, or your maximum um, temperature, which doesn't go any higher than 95C. I noticed that in the slider in the control center. The slider is all the way to the right already. So uh, you can only make it cooler, which is perhaps a good thing. Um, but the reason it's interesting is when NVIDIA introduced this, they had variable they had some metrics like base clock and then typical boost clock not max boost boost clocks not not guaranteed boost clock like typical they're like yeah this is probably where it's going to sit at most of the time but we guarantee it to hit this base clock for this release amd did not specify a base clock they only are specifying an up to clock like a maximum and right now it's uh it's a thousand megahertz or one gigahertz on the r9 290x and if you look at the reason this became an issue for me is on the NVIDIA parts, it's not a huge variance, right? Most of the time you're within 15 to 20, 25 megahertz of that typical boost clock in, in all of our testing. Uh, but what well, happened? Like they have a boost clock of, of officially 1057, but you would often see them go up to 1088 or right. 1100. It, looking back, if you look back at how AMD reacted to uh, GPU boost when it first came out, they said it was. It was not a good tactic because, um, you know, consumers don't like variability. They don't like not knowing how their part is going to perform. And at the po- at that time, we're like, yeah, okay, that's that's a fair assessment. Now, AMD is obviously adopting the same kind of uh, uh, direction with PowerTune. But in this case, they're actually giving you less information about what to expect in performance. Um, because what happens is the up to 1,000 megahertz by default doesn't last very long and and in my testing I, I ran six games for at least five minutes probably closer to seven or eight minutes before taking some um, measurements through gpuz which monitors things like your clock speed temperature uh memory consumption all that kind of deal and what you look here at this graphic you know it's actually just a screenshot from a text file you'll see that at some point we were hitting a thousand meg we were hitting a gigahertz clock speed and then suddenly it dropped down and we're in the 900s we're in the 800s right and we kind of settle somewhere in the 800s and if you look down here this is the r9 290x average clock rate um over a 60 second period now what happened is, is we ran <clears throat> a game for five to eight minutes and then towards the after that we took 60 more seconds of time and recorded the 
uh, GPU clock. And these are the average results that you see. So, you know, they go as low as Bioshock, which was down to 821 megahertz, and as high as Skyrim, which is 899 megahertz. Um, so are you saying that they're taking a page from the book of Apple in that it's not the speeds and feeds, it's the experience? I think that's that would be fair if that's what they were kind of doing. I don't, I don't know. In this world of GPUs and enthusiasts and people that are buying $550 graphics cards, they want to know information. So I think it's – I think that they deserve, buyers deserve some kind of metric that is based on this data, right? So something that says, you know, you're probably in a typical environment under typical game load. You're probably going to see – you know, if I looked at this graph, I would say a typical uh, clock rate of 840 megahertz, Right, and so that covers the two low guys of Bioshock and Crisis. But then now you feel good because Battlefield Three ran higher, Metro ran higher, Skyrim and Grid all ran higher. Um, but obviously, that's something that they that they have to note. I, it just seems kind of weird because the one gigahertz clock rate on this, like you can see clearly see, we never really hit that, and in fact, we were ten percent below that in every game. Now, did 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 you test Minecraft? I didn't test Minecraft. I'm pretty sure it would go to one gigahertz. You think so? I'm pretty sure. (laughs) Um, And then these two graphs kind of give you an idea of a what might happen if reviewers or testers aren't aware that this is happening. Um, If you start a game of Grid 2 right away, immediately start benchmarking it, you get this black line up here, and I call that uh, immediate, so for immediate testing. And then if you let the game just warm up and idle for a little while in the game engine so that it's rendering and the GPU is heating up, and this is what a real-world consumer is actually doing, right? They're, they're going to be playing games for more than two or three minutes at a time. You know, the result is this orange line. And it's lower, not by a huge amount, but, you know, a noticeable amount, especially when you get into the world of benchmarking and graphics card comparisons. So uh, all that meant was for us, we needed to have five minute warm up times on all of our on all of our gaming right and to make sure things were, were kind of heating up as uh as josh might like to say things mm-hmm. are heating up things are heating up um so i'm not going to walk you through every benchmark that we posted uh, i because i want you to go to pcpro.com and read the review uh but i'll look at you know let's say bioshock here we tested 1920 by 1080 and 2560 by 1440 and you can see if we look at uh, let's look at 2560 here Where's that at? Here it is. You can see that up, oh, up. Oh, the 290X blows away the Titan and the GTX 780 here. And Bioshock Infinite is probably the best case scenario for AMD, where uh, the the new 290X R9 290X is significantly faster than the two Nvidia options there. If we look at let's say Metro Last Light. Here's another game. We'll go to the higher resolution because, again, these are higher-end graphics cards. And you can see that the R9 290X is not only beating the GTX 780, which is the green line, uh, but also uh, the pink line, which I'm not exactly sure why it's a pink line, but it's the GTX Titan there as well. So um, there are a couple of games where it's a little bit closer, but overall I would say that the 290X is the fastest single GPU card out there. It's 550 bucks which is $100 less than the GTX 780, and it's $350 less than the Titan. Titan has other benefits with its double precision computing and whatnot, but um, in terms of gaming graphics cards, the R9 290X is the fastest, is the fastest in my opinion. But what about power consumption? It's higher. You know, if you're going up to 95C, chances are it's going to be a little bit hotter. You can see here the 290X is running it. Uh, the whole system is drawing 415 compared to the Titan or the GTX 780. They're running quite a bit less, 50 to uh, 60 watts lower. Or I'm sorry, 50, yeah, yeah, 49 to 56 watts less for the NVIDIA configurations. And then obviously we already talked about temperature here being significantly lower. So what do you what do you take? So if you know the performance, you know that the 290X is fast. It's a really, really fast single GPU graphics card. How do you balance in power consumption and uh, uh, temperature? Well, it certainly seems that uh, NVIDIA has a little bit of a leg up, especially the Titan, because it is a significantly larger chip. And you would think that it would pull more power because 
we're comparing a 430 millimeter squared chip against a essentially 550 millimeter squared chip. But even though the Titan is a little bit slower in some workloads, uh, it still has a lot of potential performance in other applications. Oh, yeah. But you're paying 400 bucks more for a GTX Titan? How yeah. much is that heat and power worth to you when in the initial outlay you're paying that much more? Uh, also consider sound levels as well. If you look at this graph, um, the 7000 series was never known to be quiet. Like the reference designs and the R9-290X really kind of goes down that same avenue, right? Um, the Titan and the 780 have really, really good coolers. Keep in mind, they're, they're running at that sound level, keeping their GPUs at 80C, where, uh, while the, the 290X is running at 95C, and it's hitting quite a bit higher sound level. So that's something else you got to consider. If you play on headphones or you're not really concerned about noise, it's not really a big deal. Um, but it seems to me that the, um, the kind of balance here, the comparison is, do you care more about the raw performance of your GPU performance per dollar do you care about like the extras the sides of is you know the, the 780 is quieter it uses less power it's a little bit more efficient you know do those things matter to you or are you a give me the best performance for my dollar and in terms of performance per dollar it's really not even close right now with the hundred dollar uh price advantage that the r9290x hat yeah, R9-290X has over uh, the GTX 780. It's it's really not even close in performance per dollar. It's really not. Um, yeah, AMD has seriously thrown us off because we heard rumors of 699 to 749 yep. for the initial offering of this product, and then they drop it down to 549.99. Did the, did the Battlefield 4... Bundles ever happen in the U.S.? They never happened, did they? Like, and they had system builders, but they never actually had. Hey, pre-order an R nine two ninety X and get Battlefield Four. No, you'd you'd go to Newegg and it'd be like auto notify. Yeah. So they didn't have Let's the see bundles have, that man. I saw. I'm gonna check right now. They're all coming soon, and no prices are listed. So this is what the search for R nine two ninety X shows today. Coming soon. Uh, and that's it. That's all we got. See, and there are some listed listed here as bundled with Battlefield 4 coupon and door hanger. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, mm. I could use one of those over the lunch hour and my wife unexpectedly comes home. Let's see. Hold on. Ken's giving me a link to check. Oh, here is one. Sapphire. Radeon R9 290X. How come that didn't show up in my search? Weird. Uh, this is with Battlefield Four for five seventy nine, so that's a pretty good deal. Thirty bucks for well, Battlefield Four. Yeah, twenty to thirty bucks. That's that's usually what Newegg does with new products. Are you on Newegg? I am on Newegg. You Newegg? <laughs> uh, yeah, because whenever a new video card comes out, they're usually one of the few guys that have lots of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. And they have like a search that works on like Amazon, where yeah. when I searched earlier for R9 290X, a uh, Radeon 7770 came up, and I was like, ah, it's not what I wanted. Anyway, um, so keep an eye out on the prices. So it's not a perfect card release. It's not perfect. Like it's, 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 it uses a little bit too much power. It's a little bit too hot. It's a little bit too loud. It's, it's but, not a GTX 460. Yeah, that was nothing really has been one like of the that last since. Perfect releases that I saw. <laughs> Ken is waving because it's the last graphics card he's purchased as well. So yeah, but with a broken <laughs> fan that uh, would well it broke later. In broke bad late. ways. You know, so it's so it's not a perfect card, but it's a really good card. And AMD now with the um, I don't know what that means. No, oh uh, yeah, we'll talk about that with uh, with the two eighty X release being the same card but a much lower price that put Nvidia in a really tough spot that they still haven't addressed in terms of pricing. You know, I'm really I'm I'm proud of AMD for doing that. And the same thing here, they could have sold this for 649 and had been justified in saying, "Hey, look, we have better performance than a Titan that's $250 more, $350, no, $250 more 
and we're we're beating the 780 anyway and we're pricing it the same way but they went $100 less you know i'm sure the $100 price difference helps alleviate concerns of heat noise whatever um but it's pretty good but we do have you know, an, looking go, back okay AMD did to Nvidia what Nvidia did to AMD mm -hmm. back when the HD seventy nine seventy was out, and it was a six hundred fifty dollar card. The GTX six eighty came out at what five forty nine or four ninety nine. It undercut them significantly, and we saw prices tumble very very fast. And I'm hoping that this will happen. To Nvidia, because obviously yeah. these are two companies that do not like e each other. <laughs> no, you're kidding. Yeah, no, <laughs> straight. I would but, never uh, believe that. Yeah, yeah I, I think history will repeat itself with these kind of price adjustments. So, but, but go ahead. The problem is the 690X is again a 290X. 290X, sorry. It's a. Uh, mid 400 millimeter square die size but titan and even what i'm assuming is the titan refresh is still around 540 to 550 millimeter square it's big that's 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 a big chip as compared to the other one especially when you're dealing with 300 millimeter wafers and uh area defects and the other issues that they run into. All right. So it's going to be interesting to see what 780 Ti actually brings to the table and what it it will be it actually is. It will be interesting. Uh, but before we go, before we, we're not wrapping up, I wanted to talk about something else here too, um, because accidentally a second Radeon R90 290X fell into uh, our lap, and I actually feel way less guilty about it now because I'm seeing other people were actually sent to graphics cards. Uh, but what we were able to do was uh, do some crossfire testing and even look at 4K tiled performance. Now, uh, you may remember in September I published an article about Ifinity uh, still not being fixed with the Radeon 7000 series. And uh, Ifinity and 4K tile displays are the same problem. I want to make sure people understand that. Uh, 4K tiled displays, 4K 60 hertz displays are essentially running Ifinity or essentially running surround from NVIDIA. There's a little bit more complication work at, but they are the same problem. So um, I decided to go ahead and spend, you know, 18 hours of my day today testing and writing up about crossfire and 4k preview so we had we had a couple of these cards now what's interesting and, and your wife is very unhappy with you because she just had nasal surgery yeah and because of some people not sending you stuff you were not able to menstruate uh, to her i i i was a horrible husband the last 48 hours as i attempted to and you know what i said all for the good of people and she she wrote back a lovely, <laughs> lovely note to me. That's good. That's good. I'm glad somebody got a couple of nice comments because I didn't. Um, so keep in mind now, the Crossfire is different. Remember, we showed you the, the connector on the cards before. There's no Crossfire connector. So the, the new Crossfire generation is called XDMA, X to the Z, whatever you want to call it. And it is... Uh, communication only through the PCI Express bus now. So all the data transfer, all the sync, all that happens over PCI Express, there's no direct GPU to GPU communication happening outside of the system bus. So other than that, I don't really have a whole lot more detail yet on what kind of bandwidth we're talking about and you know what limitations there may be, but I figured why not just test it? Why not just take a look and see? So we tested uh, 2560 by 1440, which is a single you know, head resolution. And then we tested 3840 by 2160 on the Asus PQ321Q 4K monitor, which is a tile display, uh, which is essentially setting up Ifinity. So here's a couple, here's a quick result of Battlefield 3 2560 by 1440. And what you'll see here is we're only comparing the GTX 780 and the R9 290X, and they perform very, very similarly here. Uh, but if we go down to 4K, you'll start to see something interesting. So if we look at this graph, this is an interesting graph, right? So orange is the R9 290X Crossfire. 
Now this is iFinity essentially, 4K tile display. And what we used to see is a bunch of orange, say between about this 20 millisecond range and this zero millisecond range. And it used to just fill this entire thing with this blob of orange. It's a nice orange. backdrop. Because orange. you were getting dropped frames every other frame or runt frames, um, which drastically reduced your observed frame rate and made the experience pretty piss poor. Now they have, with this driver release, with this particular graphics card, they have introduced frame pacing for iFinity and 4K tile displays. And so as a result, you see a much tighter band of orange here um, for the Crossfire configuration. Now that being said, the blue band represents GTX 780 SLI. Uh, with a, a couple of exceptions here where it's uh, hiccuping a little, the frame time bands are much narrower. So it's a, the, the AMD solution, I'm like super excited because it's, it works, like it works now. Uh, we have proof that it can be done with this generation of graphics card, um, which is like step one and getting it fixed all the way around. Uh, but there's still room for improvement. I don't want people at AMD to suddenly stop fixing all the rest of the stuff um, because yeah, there's still some improvements of a, to be made. Instead a three-inch backdrop of <laughs> right, orange, of orange. It's, it's now a quarter inch. Yeah. Uh, Bioshock, still like really ugly looking, uh, but frame pacing works. It uh, has, it actually doesn't have that much less frame time variance than NVIDIA here because NVIDIA has all kinds of issues with Bioshock Infinite. Uh, you can tell from the blue splotches of crap on the screen. Um, and also you can tell here by the huge advantage in terms of just raw average performance that they get there. Where's, uh, what's one of the ones that shows, let's see. Yeah. Here's another instance of 4k tile display working. You can see the orange, the orange line is lower. The frame time is lower indicating higher performance than the blue line that is uh, 780 SLI, but it is a wider band. There is more variance there that can still be cleaned up. It can still be fixed, but it's working. It's working. That's awesome. I think it's Metro that shows it. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit more. Yeah. So here's an instance where um, take the SLI out of the, uh, out of the picture because it's not even working right in this particular game. But if you just look at the, the orange bar of the R9 290X and Crossfire, the frame time is definitely lower compared to the black line to the orange line. You're getting improved performance. You're not dropping frames. You're not getting run frames. But this variance here is probably still close to 10 milliseconds. I would say 8 to 10 milliseconds of variance. And then maybe closer to 8 milliseconds of variance, which is going to be visible to the user. Like if you're playing that game, 8 milliseconds of frame variance when you're talking about a median of 30. Now you're alternating between 22 and 38 millisecond frame times. You're going to be able to see that, so it's still not great, uh, but it's way better than losing every other frame uh, that you were supposed to be presented. And, and it's it, nice not making a wallpaper of orange <laughs> on your graph. I bet AMD just wishes at one point I would like switch up the colors so that they wouldn't you know, be associated yeah. with it. I, now, I do need to point out there's one, the one game we have left that's DX9 is Skyrim, and it's not fixed. Right, so here's Skyrim. You have the return of the Wall of Orange. Um, not it's great. It's beautiful, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not great, but uh, it, you know it's it's so much better now. All now, what they have to do is they have to take the same fix, apply it to the DX9 games. Well, I would even before I get to DX9, I would want DX10 and 11 fixes for the R R eight two eight R nine two eighty X two seventy X the HD seven thousand series. Now the problem with that is that's a totally different Crossfire infrastructure, and I don't know how much of this fix is or is a result of the XDMA Crossfire implementation. I don't know. Or that something yet. that can even be attained. Yes, I don't know that. They say it is. Um, they say it when, 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 you know, I spoke, I mean, spoke with Raja. Raja's a pretty good guy. Yeah, exactly. And I, when good. he says it can be fixed, I believe him. He said it'd be the late fall of this year. We're just now entering fall, right? Technically? Uh, technically, yeah. Technically. We're a month into fall. So he's got 60, so he's got 60 days is left. The end of fall. Right. So we got some time. He's got 60 days left to release that. The sooner the better, though. Keep that in mind. Um, so, you know, I, I came away pretty impressed 
uh, there's a lot of I had a lot of worry. There was a lot of you know worry in the community that um, they were not going to be able to fix these issues with Crossfire in this generation of graphics cards with Hawaii uh, because well they didn't see a whole lot of Crossfire implementations. They didn't see a whole lot of Crossfire uh, configurations out there. And, um, you know, that, that kind of tells me, it initially had told me that makes me believe at least that eh, we're not really confident in what it is. And Ryan of all people is the guy who's definitely going to pinpoint those problems if they exist. So we'll just wait a little bit on that. Uh, but the fact that they did it, they do have it fixed or they have, I don't want to, I don't want to say fixed. They have it improved. It's much, much better. They still have room to get, you know, to catch up with NVIDIA in terms of the frame pacing stuff. Uh, but it's, it's definitely improved, uh, which is a benefit. Now, I just want to see that applied backwards. Just one step. Go, go back one more step to uh, Tahiti and fix it all on there. So, yeah, you can see the subtitle to my concluding page is XDMA Crossfire Frame Pacing. It works! Exclamation points, exclamation points. So. Ellipse, ellipse, ellipse. <clears throat> Something like that. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the summation of the R9 290X. Now, uh, I did say if you had any questions to uh, let me know. Let me read through some here. Uh, Jeremy wants to know about the colorful overclocking GUI for this. Let me go back to uh, our overclocking page. I didn't talk much about it because there's not, not a whole lot interesting for me to discuss yet. He's talking about this right here this heat map looking thing. So this is how you overclock now with the R9-290X. Um, it, very similarly, again, to how AMD does it, you have a power limit and then you have you can increase your GPU clock. But it's not as stable as it is. So with like uh, NVIDIA... So I it's kind of like thongs in the French Riviera. Uh, yes. Sure. Um, Let's just go with it. With, with NVIDIA, I would just turn the power target, put it all the way up. And then increase clock speed, increase clock speed, increase clock speed until you run into some kind of issue. Uh, here, that didn't work. Increase power limit up to like 20. Like I think I went 30%, 30%, and immediately crashed out. Uh, I was only able to overclock uh, the maximum clock rate from 1,000 to 1,100. So keep in mind that that's what you're increasing when you're actually increasing your GPU clock settings. Uh, and you can see here that this is the 95C target GPU temperature all the way to the right already. Uh, and I had increased the maximum fan speed to 60%, although it never got above, I think, 52 or 53% on the fan speed. So that's what the colorful overclocking thing is. Uh, is NVIDIA going to lower the GTX 780 below or at the same price of the R9 290X? I do not know that yet. I say in my conclusion that they need to. Um, they're now slower than the R9 290X, R9 290X and more expensive, which is a bad combination. Okay, so the HD 7970s and the, I think, just released about a week, week and a half ago, R9 280Xs have been at the 299 and below price range. And where have the GTX 770s stayed? 399. Okay. We have seen no erosion whatsoever. Uh, after several weeks from mm -hmm. NVIDIA. So it's it's kind of interesting to see because they, they need talk to, do to it, the though. same guys that in AMD does. They have a lot of the same partners. They know the price ranges. Mm -hmm. Why have we not seen a dip in the NVIDIA products? I mean, are they really... Well, we don't know that they haven't. That's true. Right. I mean, it's possible. And that's a fairly short window as well. Two weeks, three weeks. Um, yeah, about three weeks to re to really get a whole lot of uh, solid numbers from it. I, I, I expect them to drop this price on seven eighty, seven seventy, and seven sixty because they they really need to. Um, it's it, so their cards have some advantages. AMD's cards have some advantages, but the one that matters most to gamers is price per. Dollar. I'm sorry. Performance per Price dollar. Performance. Price per yeah. dollar is also an important metric, uh, but performance per dollar is the most important to enthusiasts, right? Because two ninety nine with a essentially HD seventy nine seventy. Yep. It's really good. So they, they've got that in two spots now. The two eighty X is a hundred dollars less expensive than the seven seventy and outperforms it, right? And now the two ninety X is a hundred dollars less than the seven eighty and outperforms it. 
So the a NVIDIA needs to do something. Um, they want me to start one up and see how loud it is. Uh, we don't have to, we don't have the microphones and that kind of stuff there. Um, could you overclock a Titan to match a 290X power consumption, or is that impossible? So they want us to take a Titan uh, to, and overclock it to the same power consumption levels as the 290X, and I guess judge performance. That's something we can attempt to do. Um, the, the the problem with the overclocking of Kepler is that you don't get a whole lot of control. My control would be uh, drag that power target all the way over and, and, you know, and see what kind of clocks we can get out of it. That's something we can try to do this week, uh, maybe if we have a little bit extra time, to see where maybe NVIDIA will go with GTX 780 Ti or a Titan Plus, whatever the heck they, they decide to release. Um, Anyone else looking forward to what the board partners can do with custom coolers? Yes. Yeah. That's one thing on the 280X that I you know, saw immediately as well was the 280X reference card was louder than I liked, but we got in uh, and I have a write-up pending of an Asus, an MSI, and a Sapphire 280X, all of which the coolers are, are much better. They're, they're, they're more efficient and they're quieter. So I, I think we'll see the same from the 290X, but it may be a little bit more because – or be a little bit longer because it's a new new ASIC, new board design. All that stuff has to be redone. With the 280X, they could just drop whatever they had on 7970 on it and, and ship it out the door. Uh, Ryan Shroud, that heat, you think it would be a problem in an enclosed case in terms of performance? You're going to need to have good airflow, right? And, and, and in particular, if we talk about those variable clock rates, they vary based on the temperature of the GPU, which will vary based on the ambient temperature that the card is in. So like in the reviewer's guide, AMD very clearly says, if you're going to run these in Crossfire, you should probably have a slot in between them, um, which is a good recommendation regardless of whose graphics card you're using, but it may be more important for the 290X than in others. Yeah, just talk to the motherboard manufacturers who create the spacing. Uh, AMD Robert, is there, I think that's not a question from AMD Robert, is there a new driver for this card? Because he would know of anybody that's on the stream. There, there was a new driver for this card. It was a beta driver that we used in our testing. I don't know when it's going to be publicly available. I would imagine today, if they're selling cards today, that would be something I would do. Um, slides hint at Ifinity optimizations. Um, I don't know what that means, I guess. Sure. Well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit better. that... Uh a lot of the Ifinity control was software controlled and not hardware. Yeah. And there were, you know, I ran Ifinity for a long time and there were issues. There were some, when you would turn around, mouse around, there were some strange things going on. And I know that looks kind of odd on my end. <laughs> But the truth is, it was disconcerting. Right. And uh, once you start getting into a slightly more engineered, hardware controlled, a lot of those issues went away. Right. And fortunately, that was kind of NVIDIA that did that with their surround. And I'm running a GTX 780, and I haven't had any of those issues where, you know, screen tearing. And it's this strange horizontal and vertical screen tearing through not so much the center monitor, but the rest of them and the flashing and, uh, you know, kind of discombobulation that we saw, it was not fun. Yeah. So hopefully, and maybe AMD Robert could answer this for us. Are these things fixed? We'll see if he replies. Somebody asked yes. uh, if I had any guess on the 290, the non X iteration. I don't know. I have no idea. I guess I don't know if it's a product or when it's going to be out. I don't know. I think it's fairly assumed now that it's going to be a part. Um, you know, and it also makes sense. They've got a 299 part and now a 549 part. There needs to be something in between that. That's a pretty big gap to just leave open um, for you know Nvidia to drop any kind of prices and that kind of thing. So it's. I, I'm sure there will be a 290, but what it is or when it will be out, I don't. I don't really know. If if we look at how AMD did their releases on Tahiti, it was kind of a regular cadence of product releases. So follow that timing, maybe. Um, 
Josh Walworth must be Italian, he says. Okay. Yeah, I am. Lots of hands. Yes, Ifinity tearing should be eliminated with global frame lock on 290X, AMD Robert says. So that's nice. That's I mean, and that's what we saw, right? Again, I would see that on that 4K tile display because it is an Ifinity configuration, essentially. Because you you saw some pretty horrific tearing on that when you yep. when you took pictures with your uh, GoPro. I did take pictures whatever. with GoPro. And it was nasty. That was yeah, the frame interleaving. I didn't see any and of that. You didn't even like rescue a kitten from a fire and give it oxygen. I didn't. But you also GoPro didn't put my video on their channel. No. Uh, so you know, I think what we'll do is we'll probably maybe um, tomorrow and this week we'll do Ifinity, like actual Ifinity testing, fifty-seven sixty by ten eighty here, and see if we notice any of those things. Uh, I think it's fairly certain. I'm ninety-nine percent sure that if I didn't see anything like that uh, during our four K testing, we're not going to see it during our fifty-seven sixty by ten eighty testing as well. But as I said, that article was basically a preview until we can get a whole bunch more testing done. Um, so uh, I think that's going to wrap up our little impromptu live stream here uh, if you guys have any questions i encourage you to go to pcper.com read that review uh two our two articles actually we have the review of the graphics card and then we have the 4k performance preview that you should look at that has crossfire and 4k results there uh, and if you have any questions leave them in the comments i will be around um for ever to answer graphics card questions forever and ever because that's all i ever do anymore Okay, Brian. Yeah. One last thing. Okay. Looking at the past two weeks of announcements, mm -hmm. would you say that we're about ready to go into a new era of 3D Affinity surround technology? Because they both are addressing some major, major issues that we have been dealing with for the past 10 to 15 years. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Are we, so 3D, I don't really think so. Uh, if it's not a head mounted display, I don't, I don't really have any, I don't have, I don't see a lot of excitement for 3D in, in, in that area. Um, I do, but, th I, go ahead. But, but with like G-Sync and then AMD fixing a lot of their affinity issues, uh, with, with, Frame, pra uh, ugh. frame pacing as well as software versus hardware controlled refresh. Mm -hmm. It's we're taking some kind of interesting steps that in the next two years we could see some really interesting and perhaps not monumental but significant jumps in what we experience ourselves when we either watch videos, play games, whatever. The, the experience is going to be a lot bigger than what we have seen. I hope so. And a jump. I, I hope so. Uh, I think that there are all kinds of things lining up to make that the case, right? If we look at the integration of x86 and traditional graphics hardware into the big consoles, Right into into the consoles. I think that helps things along. Uh, I think the move to 4K screens moves things along. I think lower cost 4K displays moves things along. I think technology like NVIDIA G-Sync that is changing how displays are implemented and kind of taking control back from the display manufacturers and putting it with people that actually care about what's going on is a good thing. Um, we are kind of seeing another golden age. And as much as I would like to pretend I'm William Shatner and I'm talking to you uh -huh. like this in, you know, very nicely paced and dramatic ways, we have a, a massive amount of technology that is coming our way in both monitors and graphics cards mm -hmm. and performance and software that... It's almost going to be like, okay, maybe not as big as, but from like 1994 to 1996, when we had no bilinear filtering, we had no real 3D rendering, and then we went to the Voodoo Graphics era, when we had bilinear filtering, we had better triangle setup, we had all these things that made a massive jump. 
And I think if we really pay attention to what's going on with these guys at both AMD and NVIDIA and Intel, we're going to see some really interesting things in the next couple of years that will give us a bigger jump in how we experience 3D and games and any other kind of content that we have seen since that point because it's like they're getting so many things together that really needed to be there and it's finally just coming into this ball where we can experience content like we really want to. I don't okay, have that, the that, same that's a hyper- golden scenario. I don't have the same really hyperbolic ha- uh, happy shiny people. Yes. But. Yes. I I would I to be honest, I would just take it if we knew PC gaming was going to be strong and 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 uh, ongoing for the next decade. That's all I really want. All that other stuff that you asked for, I'll take that too. Let's get to that point. Um, but I you know, I, I think it's it's PC gaming is showing that it can differentiate in these ways. And I and I, I agree with you that it is kind of a whole bunch of stuff coming together. And it's really hard to to see that when you do it every day or when you read every story every day about everything. You don't kind of stand back and see what's happened over the last five years or what's happened over the last ten years. So I think it's really interesting. Um, but that is a discussion for our podcast another time. So let's uh, we'll wrap up this show. Thanks for hanging out with us, guys. It's it's pretty late. We're gonna I'm gonna go sleep i guess finally so uh if you want to read more about the r9 290x again it's at pcper.com and uh with that we'll see you next time